What's up, everybody? Welcome to Unplugged with Tyler Winners and John Pierman. I am Tyler Winners. That is John Pierman. And Hi. we have a special episode here. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I think it was a couple weeks ago, we had the honor and privilege to sit down with one of John's favorite bands right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked with John Dwyer of the OCs. Uh, it was a really good interview. John pretty much did the whole damn thing. Uh, I was selfish. It's fine, man. But it was a really strong interview, and I think it was one of our better ones that we've ever done. So, you know, we didn't just stick to music. We didn't just stick to what he does. It was just a nice conversation. It was a free-flowing no, conversation. I and feel like it's uh, he's somebody that's like a full-on artist. Yes, like absolutely. Not just, not just musician. So I feel like you can talk to him pretty much about anything. So Right. So basically some of the main points that came out of that uh, interview was OCs have a world tour coming up in 2024. They are most likely going to be releasing new music. He, he hints at that. A little more information inside this interview about that. So yeah, if you guys are a fan of the OCs, you're going to absolutely love this interview, guaranteed. Or if you want and to learn about the OCs. And if you just want to learn about the OCs, dive into their uh, eclectic music catalog, I would say. It's a... Uh, no one song sounds the same to me. I feel like, when John, when you showed them to me, I, of course, checked them out. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I get, there's definitely punk. Mm -hmm. There's definitely, I, I feel like I hear old, like, classic rock in there, too, like mm -hmm. the, uh, the Rolling Stones. I hear Pink Floyd. I hear yeah. all kinds of different bands all meshed into one, but still has mm -hmm. a punk vibe to it it is the strangest and I, I mean that in the uh most respectful way i think you'd appreciate it it's just different and it's mm -hmm. very unique and there's nobody doing this that i'm aware of so it's very interesting and i think you should definitely mm -hmm. check out their catalog um now i think some people might throw in like king gizzard and the lizard wizard because they kind of change okay. styles from album to album a little bit but i don't think they have the energy level that the ocs have yeah um, especially live king gizzard's a great band too but I think OCs probably get pigeonholed with them a little bit and probably not deservingly. Sure. They're kind of a prolific band too, putting out a lot of releases and stuff like that. So there's gotcha. some similarities, but uh, I think OCs is the superior band. But. Well, and when it comes to releases, they're definitely the superior band because it seems like they have a new album or <laughs> new something coming out every year. So, you know, John Dwyer and the OCs, man, they, they stay busy clearly. And yeah, guys, let's just go ahead and get straight to it. So sit back, relax, and let's get into our interview. This is Unplugged with John Dwyer. See what I did there? Thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. I actually did not know about the OCs, never heard of OCs <laughs> until John turned me on to you guys. So John is, John, how many times have you seen the OCs live? Uh, just three now, but uh, just like I getting somebody herpes, John. The hell's wrong with I you? No, sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, I was at both. I was at both Chicago dates this year, and then one of the Chicago dates last year. So. Right on. Yeah. Was that uh, the one where you caught COVID at too? No, I did catch COVID at. Oh, OC that was show. Turnstile, resident. Yeah, so, that was something else. Yeah. So yeah, OC turnstile. shows are safe. Turnstile is more of a COVID band than us. No offense to them, of course. We're <laughs> no, more. It's true. Uh, we're more of a flu and Jardia kind of band. No, I. I don't think this cold is related to the shows from September, so I think we're good. <laughs> yeah, we do the long haul. Yeah. So I want to get started and just kind of uh, have you kind of tell us what your roots are with music and kind of how you came about just being a professional musician. Well, I I honestly, as a kid, I mean, there was always music around. My parents liked music. There's a lot, I still have a lot of their records, actually. Sure. I kind of helped their collection when they, you know, stopped caring about music when they became like proper you know older people or whatever so they turned me on to a lot of good stuff when i was a kid and you know there was music around but honestly i never really cared to play you know i hated high school so i got through it as minimally as possible and then i moved out when i was 17 and even then was just starting to get into music because i basically discovered drugs and uh mm -hmm. those two things are just wonderful together so i learned yeah. a lot quickly i had some older friends who turned me on to a bunch of like punk and metal and like psych stuff too, even, you know, I kind of started there. I started with like Celtic Frost and Slayer and like the Misfits and the Cramps and mm. Dead Kennedys and like kind of like, you know, Bad Brains, your, your, your basic like starter pack of like 
80s white punk suburban kind of stuff, yeah. heavy music kid shit. Yeah. And then I, you know, I moved out. I lived in a house where everybody was selling LSD and we were selling at raves. So like that was kind of, I wasn't ever particularly into that music, but we made a lot of money there. And then mm -hmm. once taking acid at a rave, I suddenly got it. Like I was like, oh, I get this. This makes a lot of sense yeah. to me. You know? And then uh, at that house, we started jamming a lot. I owned a guitar that my parents had given me for my 16th birthday, a red Charvel, uh, like pointy headstock kind of guitar and like a crate practice amp which are kind of coveted now, the irony. Um, and we were just jamming a lot there. We would just play for like hours and hours and hours, like beat a riff to death and like drive our other roommates crazy. It was like me and two other dudes who wanted to make like techno, who were really into the rave scene and I wanted to make mm -hmm. like, so, you know, uh, it was a nightmare, I'm sure for everybody that had to yeah, listen. It doesn't really go together too well, no? <laughs> no, not really. Maybe like Atari Teenage Riot, you know, if you got to do it really sure. at the top. But um that was like my start. And then just jamming with people really kind of got me there. I didn't really start playing seriously until I was like in my almost, almost my twenties, I would say like, I did join a band in Providence. I had two bands in Providence and my solo project that was more noise related. And like, kind of like a lot of people there uh, from Fort Thunder, like force field and the lighting bolt guys and Arab on radar, six for satellite. A lot of people were like building a lot of interesting stuff, their own gear, noise mm -hmm. stuff. You know? um god i'm kind of getting off path here but basically oh, okay. that was the root of it i didn't really get serious until i moved to san francisco i had toured uh did like an 11 day tour with landed who's on vermiform records who are still a band today who are great mm -hmm. uh but going you know out to chicago that was my first big trip and uh san francisco pink and brown and co trips were sort of my first foray into like really like eating a sandwich and like getting out there and playing for nobody for years you know and then how does it kind of wind up being you know, all the different versions of OCs that we've come to know. Well, the project started in Providence, me by myself. Uh, sure. that's a long story to get into like why the name started there. But basically it was just like grasping at straws for a name and grabbed onto the first thing and that ended up sticking. And then that became my solo project over the years. No matter what other bands I was in, I was always doing OCS, OCs. And like sort of the name change mostly because we changed sort of genre a little bit. We could start to get a little bit more like adding a drummer or stuff like that. Cause it didn't have drums to begin with really. And then it just sort of coincided with those periods of like changing members. You know, I'm on my eighth and ninth drummers right now. So it's been a pretty big yeah. personnel change over the years. And then it just started irritating the press. So that kind of became a funny thing to do because fuck them. Um, hmm. So I love that they would always focus like they changed their name again. Also, they yeah. have a new record, like in the small print, you'd be like these fucking guys. So, uh, but I think we're on this name for a while now. I can't really subtract anything more from it, but you know, uh, yeah, I was trying to think of other variations for you, but uh, we do joke around occasionally and it's like, Oh, just a letter. Oh, you know, haven't met it yet. I don't think, but was um, there any, any sort of panic when the TV show came along? Like, Oh shit. <laughs> no, because it's funny. We would always get more so back in the day. We'd get asked about that. Be like, are you affiliated? Are you from Orange County? And I didn't being from the East coast. I had no idea what that's what that meant. And then Oxycontin came along. So there's always these little waves of oh, shit. Like, what that means. And that. I'm like, totally. That's exactly what that means. It's about Orange County yeah. and Oxycontin, you know, <laughs> uh, the Sacklers were actually funding our first handful of tours. Yeah. Nice people. They didn't mention it in the Hulu show. But, that's yeah. a joke, by the way, for anybody <laughs> that might take that seriously. They're terrible people. Yes. Yeah, awful. Uh, it's Purdue, right? Yeah, it just big pharma, baby. Yeah. Um, I was gonna ask about the name changes, but I didn't want to harp on it. That's <laughs> to me. I always kind of viewed it as like a shift in the direction, like when the name. Yeah, changes, I, I, like there's I don't think it ever shift in direction. Not like so much intentionally, but another interviewer brought that to my attention, and I was like, eh, it's kind of true, actually, that it just coincided with like shifting gears, you know, whatever. Um, I I think what happened was initially the V. P H E E was kind of a bit of a joke because mm -hmm. um, we were always like labeled, you know, garage. And then I just fucking hated that. So I wanted to get rid of it. So I took that away. And then it just, and then I was looking at the name and I just didn't like it anymore. So OCs is like a, the, the name is so dumb anyway to begin with in the first place. Like I can't really explain it away. I just got <laughs> stuck with a shitty name. So I'm just trying to like, constantly beat it with, a, work with it, yeah. something i can swallow for the rest of my life you know i mean you can add any sort of punctuation after the end and then you got oh, that's name. true parenthetical just to be yeah, your, yeah. question right. mark question put a, mark. OCs? Put question a dollar mark. sign in for the s's you know just make it so it up talks whenever you say it there you go <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i like but it they're an aspiring <laughs> rapper that's not a bad idea yeah lil ocs yeah lil, lil ocs, OCs yeah. <laughs> so uh, sadly i didn't really catch on 
to uh, OCs as a whole until like 2016, 2017, mm-hmm. but I've been with you ever since. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the upcoming tour this year. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of starting with a, a few dates in the States, starting off with uh, Florida, Kentucky, and then a festival in Iowa City. How long has that festival been going on? Uh, you all are from Iowa, are you? No, are we're you? from Illinois. Illinois, okay. No offense. Um, no. I actually don't know. There was It's funny. There was another festival called Mission Creek in San Francisco when I lived there. Okay. So I don't know if they're affiliated. I'm, uh, you know, I have no idea. I had never but heard of it, so I was just wondering. Me neither. And frankly, or not. what happened this year was we were cycling the same uh, route every year because we got kind of lazy. And we would do well in these bigger cities, you know, and do two, three nights sometimes. And that's always really fun. And people treat us really well in Chicago, San Francisco, and New York. You know, we do okay. Thank God for fans, you know. But at the same time, we would get, you know, ragged on. I'll be like, why don't you come to uh, yeah. Cincinnati? And I actually, it's funny. I actually love Cincinnati and places like that. So I'm like, that's a great town. Yeah. And last year was the first, last year was the, for me, just getting a little bit older, you know, I could still do it. I love touring. I like being on the road. I like playing shows a lot. But at the same time, the 30 day thing started to just, tack on a bit of exhaustion like i would look at my drummers at the end i'd see like paul being like i'm gonna go take a bath like just like staggering off the hotel and i was like yeah, i mean those guys we, go super hard every night and stuff yeah it's like sport drumming they call it but yeah. uh we would uh we started doing 15 day tours of europe and breaking it up 15 days in the uk 15 days in europe ever since brexit basically which made things inconvenient for everybody but we noticed that the 15 day tour was actually really nice. Like right when you start getting tired, you fuck off and go home, you know? So now we're going to be breaking the U S tours that last year is my last 30 day tour. I'm not doing that anymore. Okay. So this year we're trying more B markets is the long and short of that story. So Still we're doing gonna, Chicago. So I'm excited about that. But. Yeah. We'd always get to do Chicago. Come on. I love it. No, I love Chicago. You know, my I'm wife's big, only going to let me go to one this year though. So you come back with like bruised shins and smelling like alcohol. My ears were my ears were a little fucked up after Friday night. Uh, this yeah, year, imagine so. being in I, I ear plugged it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but you know, so we're just trying to break the pattern a little bit. Also, sometimes you know, it's nice to give a place a rest. Like you know, we we do well, yeah. but people are also like, you know, I'd be sick of me. I don't understand how people can come every year. So your wife is right, is what I'm saying. No. Tell her I said so. <laughs> don't say it too loud. Uh, <laughs> No, I will say it's I like the timing this year a little bit better because it's like the last two years has coincided with Riot Fest and Mexican Heritage Festival. So it's just nuts. Yeah, we tried tried parking a sprinter. You know, it's funny. I realized we never played Riot Fest, I don't think. And I always really it's pure ignorance. I assumed it was a Riot Girl festival. And my buddy was like, no, man, it's like you guys wouldn't be invited to that Jazz festival. I have no idea. I have no idea. That's that would be in my bookers department. Well, what the fuck Riot Fest? Yeah, no, like uh, I'd rather not go up against a festival either. That's nonsense. You know, it's a miracle that we can sell out two nights at Dahlia Hall. During- no, I don't think it hurt the attendance at all. And uh, Friday night, uh, despite damaging my ears, it was it was tremendous. It's I tough was- doing multiple nights. I will say that, yeah. like, we like you know, it's always nice to make some money, and we like being able to have a day off where you're not driving, resetting up the gear, sound checking, and all that shit. But honestly, my opinion of the multiple shows, the residencies, especially back stacked back to back, and not like a weekly thing does equal that one show will always outshine the other. You can never, like, like if you're playing a Friday, Saturday, for instance, in my opinion, and you play Friday and you're like, fuck, we crushed it. And then you're like, shit. Like, tomorrow, like, what am I going to do? Like, blow myself up on stage? You know, like, it's really tough yeah. to... And Saturday night was great, too. It's just that... I, I mean, you know... Friday night was just you do, you do play a show where you're like, that was great. And then the next night, you're like, yeah. we sucked tonight. And you're like, no, sorry, Saturday. All. You know, it's just... It is what it is. You know, there's certain things in the ether that, you know people being tired or just the energy no it just seemed like dan and paul locked in on friday night somehow a little bit more than saturday night we always get excited to go to chicago too you know they treat us well good food good people uh that place thalia hall man it's got like a i love it yeah i could could sleep in the fucking green room there you know what i mean it's so nice you're like i could just i don't even need to get a hotel just sleep on this couch right here you know i'll try to sneak back in there next time yeah Yeah. well now that we're friends you just call and you get a free ticket don't tell you oh no i don't want to do that i'd rather pay Hey, That's you have um, you have John's email now, but uh, that's true. John, can I chime in real quick because we yeah. brought up Dan and Paul, and I just think that that is so unique to have two drummers. Uh, you just don't see it too often. I don't can't think of any band that does that. For anybody listening, the OCs have two drummers at all times. So, what was your decision to go with? two drummers in the first place because I mean, from what i've seen live uh from live videos and what john has told me dan and paul seem super super tight 
Yeah, they are. They're, they, they're, I mean, we've had double drummers before. Every time I add a new member, I feel like we kind of ramp it up a little bit. So these guys are very much on point. Like, you know, Dan's like the meat and potatoes and Paul's like the sort of garnish and gravy, I guess, or <laughs> the frosting. I don't know. They, they, they're different style of drummers. But, you know, we had double drummers with Mike Schoen and Lars Finberg back in the day. This is something that you wouldn't know, I'm sure. But um, and early on in, in OCs, we had uh, a lot of percussionists would play on our records o- over the drums. And I just love drummy things in general. Yeah. I mean, I'm a guitar player uh naturally but I, I love percussion so you know things like adam and the ants the almond brothers the grateful dead um bow wow wow uh there's a million bands i can think of not million but you know there's a lot of bands i can think of with double drummers that i absolutely adore up uh, even prince had like sheila e and yeah another right band. yeah so that kind of shit latin music latin jazz uh Colombia or uh, Cuban music always has like a bunch of you know it's just like world music in general I feel like would focus more on on percussive stuff big fan of that you know and then also, obviously if you're playing like rock or punk or metal you know I've even seen a couple metal bands with double drummers I know the Melvins did it uh there's this band called Hot Hot Jets or some shit from Portland that were really good that had double drummers like China symbols really high you know really like a cool aesthetic I think Visually, it's cool to see people syncopate and then yeah. play in unison, you know. Uh, we have some ambitious, or I have some ambitious ideas for this new one. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it's I, I love a lot of drums, you know. Yeah. I'm a big fan. Even uh, there was a band in Providence called La Machine, and the band Landed I was in also had double drummers back in like the late 90s. I think probably I mostly stole that from Providence, Rhode Island. The scene there was so specific that I cut my teeth on like playing on the floor, not playing on stage, bringing your own PA. There's a lot of like uh, in audience, not aggression, but like sort of forcing the audience to be a bit involved in the show, sure. which would often make for something interesting happening at the show, you know. And there's something to be said for them being out front, too. Just yeah, I mean, I, too. And, dude, I, it's funny. The only thing that's really changed from when Mike Schoen and Lars were in the band was and poor Mike Schoen, because he really was the one that where like the volume kept when he was in the band. He was in the band for like seven years, I think. I'd be like, OK, I'm going to ramp up the volume. You know, and the amps are like bigger, 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 bigger. But my mm. thing, and this is again a very much like an East Coast Providence thing, was like you got to set up in front of the amps so you can hear everything we're doing, especially if we're improvising. But he would just get like, I swear, by the end of the band, he'd be like, "What?" Like he couldn't hear shit, and it was because I realized we would create this like sort of wall around him from behind, and he never needed a lot of monitoring because like he could hear everything. But at the same time, he was getting punished. So now, if you look. I'm like set up just shy of blasting Paul with my amps and Tim is like sure. way in the back and Tom's in between the drummers. So we're set up in a way that's only ever at the, the minimal amount of respect you can have for somebody's ears. But we are still like an incredibly shrill, loud band, you know? Yeah. Loud and fun is usually how I describe it when somebody asks me. You know, I'm I'm a, it's loud, loud and it's fun. I'll take that compliment. Yeah. Um, so you're doing Japan this year. Did you do Japan last year? I don't believe. No, Japan kind of just reopened up after COVID. Like, I think gotcha. Japan oh. and Italy were the two joints. Yeah, they were the two joints that we really couldn't get back into quick enough, in my opinion. But obviously, you know, people have their own gauge for feeling comfortable. Sure. Um, the funny thing about Japan right now is that, I, I mean, touring there is great. For me, it's like the most, I mean, places I've been, it's the farthest way you can get from like American and like Western style things. Like South Korea and Japan, I would say, are like, as an American rolling in there, you go in the hotel. It's like being in a fucking UFO. You know, it's just like very, everything's yeah. different. They're really into like technology. I remember I couldn't turn off the lights in the South Korean hotel. And I ended up sleeping with like a rag <laughs> tied around my eyes because it's just like full light in the room. You know, I was like, it was like, like a Korean iPad on the wall. But like, you know, just digging on the other culture and having a really nice time at the shows, playing with Japanese bands in particular. The people, the guy that's setting up Shinji from DMBQ and Boredoms is great. But I think during COVID, they made their visas really hard to get for obvious reasons. And sure. that meant that now that I'm working with a visa guy and Shinji to set up the visas, it's a huge pain in the ass. So, so that, uh, that was like, I'm like, I'm like, please let the, the tour actually work out after all this, you know? Yeah. I had one more question about Japan. I'm a huge record guy. I was wondering, mm-hmm. do you do any like record shopping when you're there? Because that's yeah, the um, prime place that, to do record shopping. Yeah. I mean, have you ever been to Japan? I have not. No. Okay, my favorite thing about the record stores in Japan, other than the fact that you're going to be able to find old, for the most part, Japanese music. So if you're looking like Mainliner or any of that kind of shit, like old heavy Japanese psych, Flower Traveling Band, it's not that hard to find there. 
But my favorite thing about Japanese record shopping is bootlegs. They love bootlegs. So there's tons okay. of lo- like I b- picked up like a bunch of live beef heart records from like the early 80s that are really burning recordings at the, the Magic Band. And then also like some crazy Pink Floyd shit I'd never seen before, like like four record sets of them just playing straight, like improvised stuff and uh, Roxy music, like really just they love like there'll be a huge bootleg section you're going through you're like fuck i want to hear all of this some yeah. of it you get it all the way back to the states and you're like this sounds like it was recorded on like an almond joy from yeah seven- it's always a gamble with the, yeah. the bootlegs so but that's fun you know but yeah. i've definitely toned down my record buying on the road because i have such a big collection now that it's a bit of a problem and then i realized i was just hauling around like a tote bag with that like a 70 pound tote bag slammed with records trying to get on the plane and shit and i just now, if I hear something, if I really need something, I'll buy it. But I'm not super concerned about like originals, you know, like first sure. pressings or whatever. Yeah. But in Japan, too, a lot of those Japanese pressings of like I bought some can records that were Japanese pressings that are really cool that they have like the you know Japanese banner paper around mm-hmm. the stuff with the ads on the OB and all that. Yeah. yeah, you would love shopping there if you're a record guy, though. It's very it's like yeah, I'm a huge jazz. I'm a huge jazz guy, so it's like jazz. Dude, Japanese for, jazz, yeah. too, man. Yeah. They were yeah. like uh, they were ahead of the curve on a lot of like crazy improv shit in the 70s and 80s the mm-hmm. japanese as usual the japanese like the germans or something they would take something and be like what if we made it more insane and you're like nice mm-hmm. you know, like real noisy um that's like any conservative really hyper conservative culture kind of breeds that kind of pressing back really yeah like experimental art yeah. now japanese yeah. jazz is always really far out also their toy uh shopping over there we have our, our merch guy barry who runs all our merchandise is a big toy collector and it's like it's just i think what actually the last time i went there i literally got a suitcase bought an extra rollback and just filled it with toys and brought it home like an idiot yeah. but they're amazing toys you know sure sure very cool hey so what are uh the recording plans for 2024 i'm expecting another release in august so i just finished demoing our new record right uh, did a slightly different um i mean we kind of always the past few records we demoed a little bit beforehand and bring it to the rest of the band and have like sort of mm-hmm. ideas. And this time I did it by myself, but it was really fun. I had a good time doing it. Like I've been sober for three days now. I'm taking like little breaks every now and then. And it's, uh, it sucks. God, like I remember Bill Burr saying, it's like, you're just taking life in the face. But for mm-hmm. the past week or two, I was just smoking weed and writing riffs and right. Making drum loops. And I wrote sure. the whole record or, you know, the, the, the sort of, skeleton for it and i'm bringing it to sure. the band on monday so we'll start playing the net and then hopefully recording and getting a new record out okay great right on great um any plans for any like live recordings coming up uh um we did just we did just play those ocs shows me and bridget dawson did the acoustic duo and i got some nice stems from that but i haven't really sat down and listened to them yet gotcha or as ocs go maybe maybe i mean everybody it's funny about a live record like we sell them okay people don't like live records man you know like castle face would put oh, them all the time and they would like we would put out like ty or like uh alex cameron you know these great bands but like people just don't give a fuck and it's funny because so often a record and a live version obviously are completely different like i remember seeing bands that are like these like real punk like you know annihilating bands live and then you listen to the record you're like man it's produced like shit like it's real safe sure. especially some 80s stuff it just doesn't hold up you know it's not the same just, kind of experience i would say even more so now like now yeah. i see a band live and i'm like these guys rip and then i buy the record and bring it home and it's i'm kind like, of flat oh just do you think yeah. do you think the interest in live albums is more of a generational thing or do you I'm think <laughs> us too, i guess I'm, I'm old too yeah because i know john and i we love live uh i love live, live albums records. And yeah. and, I, and then I wonder if it's a generational thing or if it's a more of a musician thing. So John and I know how to you know play music. We appreciate live music roughly. So we we prefer to hear live music. We hear music in its uh, you know original form. So yeah, I wonder sometimes if you want to hear the too. room. You know, yeah. I think it's always interesting. You know, especially I mean, obviously jazz. There's a, a lot of those a lot of the records you hear are just live versions of that. Yeah, you sure. Know? Yeah, they're playing. I, there, a, I was listening to a record that I didn't realize was live and had it cranked so hard that I was like, "Wait, is this a live album?" I like heard an audience really faintly in the background. I was like, "Oh shit, it's sure. completely in front of a, a room." I think, um, yeah, I don't know if it's a generational thing. I would, I, I, I mean, we sell them okay because our fans are cool and they want to. They want. They know we're going to improvise and things will change ever so right. much. But uh, 
yeah, man, I just don't know. I was like, I, I would always think like, this would be really fun to record this, you know, as part of the process, like dragging a tape machine to the show, recording it, mixing it with the band, coming up with, yeah. we had a photographer that shot all the stuff, you know, he would do all the, the record covers and stuff. And it was just like, you know, family thing. But I probably am going to lean a little bit away from that coming up. Just, we've, we've put out so many. We have so many sure. live records, you know? Yeah, I, mean, I just love the like levitation the sessions yeah. and uh, yeah, the live in San Francisco well, record I love a lot, too. That was imperative, though, because it was COVID. And yeah. I really didn't want to do it. Yeah. And then I was just so fucking bored that we were like, fuck it, let's do it. Let's try the stream. Sure. And I think that charity one that we did, the third levitation one was like the the most money we ever made doing anything, which was great. So cool. charity, but it was just like, you know, we realized that people were hungry at that time. You know, even I was watching other people's live streams. Right. You know, I was just like, all right, like this is what's happening. I'm, can I grow a beard? Maybe I'll watch XX live performance today in a, in a weird kitchen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My early, <laughs> my early pandemic experiences were playing poker, uh, like on my phone making a bunch of money and then just like buying every OC's record I could find. <laughs> I'm glad that's to what hear that I associated you somebody really, else's yeah. money and bought our records. That's yes. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Congratulations. So I wanted to talk about uh, the last record intercepted message a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I just have some like selfish questions I want to ask you because I'm such a huge fan, but uh, there's a song called die laughing. Mm-hmm. And I really hear a lot of fear of music on it from talking heads. I was wondering if that was, I love that record. You know, it's funny. Um, that record's been coming up a lot lately. That was one that they do with Eno, right? That's yeah. yeah I, I think, think that's, that's the first Eno record, yeah. And that's the one. You know, I mean, I love Eno. We actually had the, another conversation, sort of adjacently, about like who would you rather party with, Eno or Ferry? And I was like, Eno's awesome, but Brian Ferry, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. I yeah, feel Brian like there'd Ferry's, be more women. You had a good Brian time Ferry. with Brian Ferry, but you had an esoteric conversation with Eno. Sure. But I did like the story about him. I think this is. I'm, I might be wrong about this, but he did that record as if it were. Uh, like loops or samples where the band was just learning parts, right? And then mm-hmm. he was constructing it like, okay, parts four, seven, four, seven, nine, and they would just slap shit together. Before I'd heard that, I realized that we had been working like that. Like I would bring in parts, 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 and we would record, you know, play them ad nauseum, record them and find bits in there. But often we were just cramming shit together. So a lot of our older, like proggier stuff definitely was coming from that school of thought. Um I'm, you know, talking heads are essentially from Rhode Island. That's where they mm-hmm. started. Um, so there's a little bit of maybe common thread there. I don't think so, but that's another band too that like that song in particular that you're mentioning has like five drums on it. There's tons sure. of percussion. That's very much a talking heads thing. And I think we're emulating that era that they were from. So okay. inadvertently, maybe a bit of them got in there. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Um, no, that that live 1980 in Rome television special. You ever seen that on the Talking Hands? I think I've seen a bit of it. Adrian yeah. Ballou playing guitar with like, yeah. Big oh man, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, it's so good, dude. Yeah, I always liked the uh, the the double live record because it's the 81. when I was a kid, when I was in Providence, it's very much just like an ignoramus thing. But I hated them. Like I just didn't sure. like their band. I thought it was kind of pussy. You <laughs> know, like yeah. for us back in the day, I was like, it's got to be noisy and aggressive and aggro. And now I'm like, the hell's wrong with me? This is an amazing band. I like absolutely adore them. It came with, you know, letting go some ego and, and waking up to more of life as I got older, loving shit like that, you know? I used to have conversations all the time, like, who's the best American band? Like, ever, you know, because you, you try to think of all these legacy bands and they're always usually British or, yeah. you know, well, who's the best fucking American band? It's like, is Boy it Bob. Dead? <laughs> or, you know, I just kept playing. I, I, I think it's the Talking Heads. That's such a that's a that's a big question. That's a tough. Like, I know it is. But... Like, what's your favorite record? I'm like, I can't really fucking answer that. Honestly. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't just ask over the that. years, you know. Yeah, I always think about that scene from uh, from Stand by Me, where they're all talking about Oof. like what what their favorite food is, and the little chubby kid says cherry flavored Pez, and it's like his last meal, and they're like cherry flavored Pez. He's like, what? what? You're like, that that can't be your last meal, dude. For the record, for the record, Stand by Me is my favorite movie of all time oh really it's there funny you know, i just absolutely. went back and looked. hit the nail on I'm, the head. A, I'm a big fan of stephen king so you know yeah. i always i'm always especially you know when i i don't know how old you guys are but I, when i grew up like that's when all his films were sort of like getting stacked it was like kubrick and then like stand by yeah. me and it's like so he had like a that yeah, was a big part of my childhood you know all those films oh yeah well i think it came out when we were like four or five and it was pretty damaging Fucking terrifying yeah. <laughs> right my dad my dad wouldn't tell me what it was about he was just like no it's just <laughs> it 
So I was like, okay, I'll watch it. And You'll be fine. You'll be years fine. of nightmares. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny is I went back and watched that recently because I was watching the new ones, and I, I wasn't super into them. There's like elements of it, like I thought the, the clown was great, whatever. Yeah, but I was like, was great, yeah. this is pretty swaggy, I think. And I was like, I remember the original one being great. So I actually went back and watched the originals, and I was like, Jesus, this is terrible. Yeah, no, retrospectively. But I forgot that it was fucking Harry from Night Court is in the movie, and I was like. I was like, I can't take this seriously. I'd be like, you know. And John Ritter's in it. John Ritter. Uh, although, man, John Ritter, man. John Ritter, man. Yeah. He, he had even, I'm so sad that he's gone because he was a big part of my job. I loved Three's Company was a kid, when I was a kid. But I recently went back and watched Bad Santa, and he is so hilarious in that. <laughs> the uptight guy. I was like, John yeah, Ritter's just, in great roles at the end, man. Playing the straight guy, yeah. Yeah. Um, also, the last two tracks on the record, is that any kind of indication as to what the new record's going to sound like? Because it's kind uh, of like- I mean, me and in a Tom, different direction from the rest of the record. No, no, it just you know we always kind of got away in the past with having a sort of eclectic sound. I mean, foul form was like you know real Punisher yeah, straight yeah. straight from the back. It's pretty rare these days that we have a record that's like solidly one thing. I think we sure. can sort of lean more into like the broadness of being like it's eighties, you know, like so for our yeah. version of eighties was like punky eighties, you know, like new wave or whatever. Yeah, it was like John Husey to me. Yeah, uh, dude, huge fan. You know, like fucking Molly Ringwald all day. Judd, Judd Nelson, Estevez, mm-hmm. all the all the hits. But um, yeah, I, I would love to do an, a straight record of '80s pop hits, like these sort of like prom songs I've talked about before. I'm a big fan of like the DX7 and like old drum machines, and like you know, I love uh, Wang Chung and Duran Duran, and like uh, you know, uh, Stacey Q. I, I'm like a big fan of all that '80s stuff. I grew up with it, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because I remember when I was a kid, again, being like into punk and metal, like hearing people talk about like, you know, keyboards, you know, it's like not real music. And now I've gotten into all that stuff. And I'm like, fucking keyboards are hard to play as hell, man. Like, what are you yeah. talking about? You know, it's a like, lot of work. I'm a terrible keyboard player. And I have way worse than I am on guitar, you know. So it's no less, uh, you know, no less of like a visceral music experience to me to be playing like 80s pop stuff. I would like to do more songs like that, though. And Tom... Is like a guru when it comes to stuff. So if you're like, this is what I want. He's like, like that? And you're like, exactly like that. It's like a jukebox. (laughs) Yes. A sexy jukebox. So you also had two uh, kind of side project records, uh, Ritual Habit Ceremony and Posh. After a fresh member, Posh Swat. So can you talk about uh, a little bit like what the process is for those kind of side projects? Yeah. Those are just like, uh, I mean, been doing a lot of improv records for the past few years. I think like, it kind of got to the point where I was like, okay, we do like guitar, bass, drums, horn, and then just fun to mess around with instrumentation or ideas. So like, for instance, the record uh, Endless Garbage I did, that was during COVID and nobody that was on the record had ever met each other and they didn't meet each other for the sessions. So it started with Ted Burns playing drums, gave me those files. I brought in the double bass player. He played. So I was the only uh, sort of nucleus for the whole thing. Nobody else. Okay. Knew. And they all met eventually afterwards. But like working on improv stuff, like that's fun. So the posh SWAT thing, I just wanted to do something that was like strictly percussion based. So it's like yeah. percussion triggering sounds, drums, hand drums. I built a like three or four big like hammered instruments in my house that we use on them with contact mics and stuff. Sort of very reminiscent of like Providence to me. And I just wanted to make something kind of fun. I had a weird esophageal speech mic that like was like, sort of like lashed to my neck that I could uh, trigger with drums. So I'd be singing while we played and that stuff would pop out in the snare hits and just, you know, fucking around with it. And the same thing with the, uh, and then the opposite end of that would be the ritual habit ceremony record that has pretty much no drums on it. That's all symphonic yeah. instruments and uh, synthesizers edited uh, improv. And then um, basically played over again after that the string arranger came and like wrote strings over her improvisations and sort of uh flushed it out a bit and made it more lush and then i mean she's great heather Lockie, she's a genius and then uh having it sent out remotely to all these uh singers all over the world so yoshimi from japan boredoms exec arthur uh walski you know Cereza, the peruvian singer lived in texas at the time and just all these and bridget you know azita in chicago from Scissor Girls, Bride of No-No. It was really fun. Just a fun project, you know. Okay. I don't anticipate that's going to be a boon of cash or anything. That was for, like, diehard stoner fans to have something sort of new to check out, you know. Right on. 
very gratuitous for me. That one was like all about me just enjoying the process. And then we're like, and well, we right. fucked out a record at the end. And that's that's yeah. good enough for me, you know? So, so we were here kind of, I sense that there's some like kind of free jazz kind of improvisational influence there. Who are your influences as far as that goes? Well, when I started doing all that stuff, sort of, pre-COVID and into COVID and released a lot of improv records sort of in a row. That was really like ECM inspired the label, which was like $5 records sort of like 10 yeah. years ago. You can buy those records for nothing. In fact, still here in LA, I got a couple of buddies that run stores that'll hit me up and be like, yo, uh, some guy died and had a bunch of these. Do you want them? And it, Oh, like they're 30. always in great shape too. Like yeah, I've never seen a beat like, up ECM record. They're real collectors kind of nerd records. Uh, I do love that their YouTube channel, you can't watch it. Like you can't watch any stuff on their YouTube Unless you have a premium, they're like the only thing, I, only company I know that like nuts box their videos. And you're like, dude, but wow, Jack D. Jeanette, uh, uh, Stu Martin, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? There's Even Dave Holland's on there. Yeah, man. So this that label was just full of because it was sort of that picking up where like sort of Miles Davis had started with the Miles Davis '70s fusion mm -hmm. stuff. Um. It, again, it's a German label. They had their own studio, a beautiful sounding studio where they recorded like all those Bar Phillips records and stuff. Really killer shit. Like and the Terz Ripped All stuff's great too. Yeah, man. That first, uh, what is it, Bleak House record is ripping, man. I love that. Album. Have you heard the one that's on Flying Dutchman, the George Russell uh, no. esoteric circle? No. It's just uh, great, it's like, great title. Terz Ripped All. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, Garberek. I, yeah, guy's Garberek's Dutch, right? on there. Um, it's like a quartet. It's really good. Though. You have to send me a link. I never heard it. But I love okay, all. We'll I love that the Teutonic appreciation for jazz was like rock and like cinematic, sort of like yeah. weird film and like slightly occult, weird like witchy shit. And then like you know, but the fact that they did so many records with Jack DeJohnette, that's for yeah. me. He was he's like, like the house drummer, yeah, dude. He's like one of my favorite drummers of all time. And even today, like, I, and he's still around. But you, you see, watch like a recent video of him doing a drum clinic, and you're like. He's like all day. Still alive, yeah. He's like in a, he's old man playing drums. You're like, still got it. Still yeah. weird as fuck. Still totally funky yeah, and rocking. Great you know? touch, dude. Yeah. Yeah. He had his um, own heads. They were like, we should make heads that sound like Jack DeJohnette. You're like, that'd be like if Slayer had their own strings. You're like, these will make you sound like Slayer. You know, you're like, like I don't know. Guaranteed. Man. Yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah. So you guys were featured on a couple episodes of Reservation Dogs, and I wanted to know if you had any knowledge of that or. No, I did. I remember. I didn't know there were two of them, though. That's cool. Um, yeah, I think uh, towards the beginning of the series and towards the end of the series. So, is it over? Yeah, yeah. Did they I just said the last need... season. Yeah. Oh man, I need to watch it. Um, um yeah, it I heard great. it was good. I haven't seen it, but uh, you know, uh, we have um, publishing now through Domino, uh, so they come to us with stuff but basically you know i'm always a fan of I, I watch you know i was a latchkey kid in the 80s so i grew up with a lot of television so i'm still a fan of shows like episodic comedy and drama you know we're actually i mean sort of related we've been trying for a while now to get a show on a reservation in uh arizona and it's finally happening this year at shiprock in new mexico which is cool this guy mandy books shows there so i'm excited to go there and play hey, with a local band turn it into a live record there you go yeah right i think it's funny every week we get a little update as to how many tickets we sold from our from our booker who like you know they aggregate grab all the clubs information or whatever and you know you've sold this many tickets here uh which is always a depressing prospect you're like oh and then but it's shiprock new mexico which we're all really excited about it was like over the past three months it's been like you sold two tickets and i was like oh jesus please let some people be there you know <laughs> so we'll see but I'm excited to, the, I guess the local band that we're playing with is the promoter's son, and I heard they're great. So I'm, I'm psyched, you know. Awesome. Something new. And I just wanted to kind of talk film with you a little bit. One of the videos I kind of watched in preparation for this was uh, your Criterion Closet Picks. Mm -hmm. And you talked a little bit about true stories. Uh, the oh, yeah. Head, back to the Talking Heads film. They were just showing that on, uh, it was touring around again, too. I think David Burns actually. No, are you thinking of Stop Making Sense, maybe? No, a concert uh, film or, each, or a true story. They just okay. played here in LA, and I, I, I'm almost positive I could have this wrong, but I think David Burns was actually there, but I couldn't make it. I had other plans. Okay. That night. No, yeah. I, I think they did do Stop Making Sense too, but it was back a few months ago. They did it. Yeah, maybe they did both. They're I don't showing know. it on IMAX, I think. So I, actually, I went and saw that like October. It was great. Right, right, right. So they cleaned it all up. It was great. Um, that's really all. All the questions I had for you. I don't want right to take on. up too much of your time, but it's a pleasure talking to you and. Glad you were able to do this. Yeah, nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah, 
Yeah, John, it really, we, we really do appreciate it. I guess before we let you go, is there anything else that you want to share that maybe the fans should know uh, anything that we didn't hit on that maybe we should have, I know you got, we, we know you got the world tour coming up, uh, around in august you're going to be hitting the, the states for sure it's a, it's a mess this year we're just going everywhere we're going can. everywhere uh, we do around now, the world you're going to be recording eventually sometime yeah this year. <laughs> so i'm Mid-bay. assuming an album will probably come out oh yeah we'll be this dropping. year if um, unless somebody kills me we'll be dropping a record that's here you never know though i mean life has been pretty chaotic lately <laughs> sure it's an election year after all yeah right you're like covid finally got them shit <laughs> it took five times. But yeah, is there anything else uh, um, that you want to share? No, uh, no. We're just excited to get back out on the road. We took a few months off uh, to give ourselves a little breath of air, which is always nice. Um, but it's funny. It's always the same, man. Like uh, you, you go on the road for a long time. You get tired. You're ready to go home. You get home. And then you're ready to go back on the road. It's like I'm just looking the other way. So I'm trying to take time to relax a little bit these days, but at the same time, you know, I love all the cities we play in and all of our fans are always so great to hang out with. It's like half of our show is about the audience. So it's really, for me, like a huge dopamine, you know, natural high to connect with crowds like this in these cities that we love and things like going to Chicago and eating at Portillo's at 2 a.m. And a girl that serves me my sandwich yell at me, you know, (laughs) I'm all like, I love this place. She's like, let's go. Yeah, Portillo's is great. Portillo's is yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny. Uh, we went to a bunch of like smaller, like family owned ones, but for some reason that chain just always killed me. Where I was like, just they have like oh, right, a bake fries. I was that's what I want. I just want to get back <laughs> to that. I want to, you know, after years of moderating away from hard drugs and stuff, I was like, yeah, I like just to show up in these towns and eat good food and hang out and meet people. Yeah. You know, see old friends. That's what it it's is, all about. You know, yeah, getting a little older, you start noticing your buddies are like, nah, I don't need to come see you anymore. Like my fifty <laughs> year old friend, he's like, nah, I'm a great show. Fuck off, you know. <laughs> nice to see you guys, huh? All right, nice meeting you. Uh, would lo- love to have you back uh, after the new record, baby, and talk about that. Yeah, holler anytime, man. You know, you know how to okay. get in touch. And again, like I said, if you want tickets, you know how to get in touch. All right, sounds good. Thanks, well. John. Appreciate it, John. Have a good one, man. Appreciate it.